Oh, yeah, there is a few people here, isn't there? <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, we can probably get started. So, hi, uh, my name's Colin, and this is my Please Trust Me slide. Uh, so now that you've seen it, hopefully you trust me and, and you believe the things that I'm going to say. Uh, so I work for Vehicle. If you haven't heard of Vehicle, we're a software development agency uh, based out of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And what we do is help other software companies build and design great applications. If by the end of this talk, uh, you think that I've said some good things, you might want to check out our Torqued podcast. Uh, I'm a regular guest on the podcast, and you can find out more information at uh, vehicle, uh, podcast.vehicle.com. Okay? So I want to start with a story. I really like to start my talks with stories. So just to set the stage, the year is 2008, and you better be ready to pick a side because <laughs> Twilight is tearing families apart. Not only that, Katy Perry is playing Kiss and Tell. The web has a sequel, and have you heard of this jQuery thing? It's pretty, it's pretty new, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, buttons are full of gel, right? And everything has a drop shadow. Everything has a drop shadow. And uh, Taylor, well... <laughs> Taylor is just a young man with a dream. Uh, but this story isn't about Taylor. This, Taylor uh, this story is about a friend of mine. So <laughs> uh, my friend is a junior developer starting at a new web agency, and he is just loaded with imposter syndrome. He's really worried that every day he goes into his new job is going to be his last day, and he's going to be fired. So uh, what he does is he musters up all of his courage, and he talks to the senior developer, and he says, how do I become a good developer? Uh, and so the answer that he gets is a little bit of a riddle, at least to him it is. It's read the design patterns book. It's by the Gang of Four. And not wanting to make himself seem any more silly, he says, oh yeah, of course, of course, the design patterns book. I mean, it's been on my list, but I'm just going to bump it up. I'll, I'll read it for sure. Uh, so he goes home and he frantically tries to figure out just who this Gang of Four actually is. <laughs> and... Um, and he finds out that the Gang of Four is this group of gentlemen, and this book about design patterns that they wrote is literally called Design Patterns. And uh, so he obtains the book in every legal way that you can imagine and, uh, <laughs> and starts going through it, right? But he finds that uh, it's a little hard to understand. So just to get an example here, let's take a look at Adapter. So Adapter convert the interface of a class into another interface clients expect. Adapter lets classes work together that couldn't otherwise because of incompatible interfaces. It's pretty clear, right? Well, if that's not, if that's not helpful, at least there's a useless diagram to help you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're left feeling like this, right? But, but maybe that's an anomaly, OK? Maybe strategy is a little easier to understand. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a family of algorithms and encapsulate each one. We're going to make them interchangeable, so a strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from the clients that use it. Sure, right? Everybody can go out and do that now. Here's another useless diagram. Uh, <laughs> and we're stuck feeling like this, right? So the years go by, and my friend, he gets over his imposter syndrome, and he realizes that back in 2008, the problem wasn't him, okay? The problem, well, it wasn't with the Design Patterns book either. Uh, it was a combination of the two. So basically, my friend is a web developer. And the Design Patterns book was written at a time where web development wasn't much of an industry. So the examples that are given in the Design Patterns book don't really relate to him and his everyday work. So even though the ideas are good, they're just inaccessible to him. So what would have been better for him when he asked the senior developer, how do I become a good developer? was that senior developer saying, well, let's work on that together. What I can do is I can show you some design patterns that I use day to day to help make our code cleaner and more maintainable, and that's what I plan on doing today in the next 30 minutes. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I use a couple of patterns uh, in my day to day that make my code easier and more easy, uh, more maintainable. So we're going to start by looking at the adapter pattern. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show how we can use it to integrate third-party APIs. We're going to talk a little bit about dependency inversion, 
and then we're gonna see how we can use the container to swap out implementations. From there, we're gonna move on to the strategy pattern, and I'm gonna show how you can use the strategy pattern to clean up branching logic in large classes. Uh, we're gonna do that using a pretty in-depth refactoring, and I hope you like it. And then finally, we're gonna look at the factory pattern, and we're gonna see how factories generally have a tendency of hiding in our code, and so we're gonna learn how to identify factories and then use the extract class refactor to pull them out and put them more on the outside of our domain where they belong. Then we're gonna see how we can use the auto wiring feature of the service container to build our factories for us. So we're ready to start? Let's talk about the adapter pattern. <laughs> All right. So here's, here's just a bit of a primer for adapter. So let's say we have two components, right? So we have component A and component B. And we own component A and it talks in messages uh, that component B doesn't quite understand because it was written by a, a third party package. Uh, so what we actually need is we need something in the middle that takes the messages from A and converts them into something that B understands and then takes the return values from B and converts them into something that A is actually expecting. So that thing in the middle is our adapter. So our scenario is, let's say that we work for a news aggregator site and the product people, what they wanna do is they wanna increase engagement uh, on the site and they think what they can do is by creating a local news sidebar. They're gonna determine what local news is by geolocating the users based on their IP address. So we can do this, right? Sounds like what we need is a local news controller. And we went out and we found that there's a package called IP location and we can use that to get a location back. So it has a method on it called locate that we just pass the IP address to it. Now what we can do is we can take that location that we got and we can pass it into our near scope on our news model, right? We're gonna get the news back and then we're just gonna send it back over the API in a news resource. So we think that's pretty good. So we put it up for PR and GitHub's new PR assistant comes up and it says, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you may be letting the decisions of third party developers leak their way into our domain logic, literally gluing ourselves to their implementation. Would you like help fixing that? Uh, so what they're talking, well, what Clippy's talking about here is that you see how location here is being passed into the near scope? We don't actually own location. So we can't define what it is. We can't define what the attributes are inside of it. So when we choose to pass location into our near scope, we're saying we're gonna marry ourselves to this IP location package, even though it's not ours. So if it changes, we're gonna have to change everything else that has that location in it. Um, what would be better is if instead we created something that we owned, like a mark, and we can construct the mark using the information from the location. And what we've done is we've said, now we can pass the mark into our near scope. So we own mark, and if we change mark, we know we're gonna have to make changes to further things, but we probably won't, right? And so we've inverted that dependency. Now we depend on something that we own as opposed to depending on something that we don't own. So that goes up for PR and it works. Actually, it works really well. Engagement goes up and, um, and people are staying on the site longer, but ops, ops is sad, right? Because it turns out that the IP location package isn't very reliable. We get timeouts and bad responses, things like that that they don't wanna deal with. So what ops did is they fixed the problem in my favorite way. They they fixed it with money and they bought uh, an IP database that we can use. So we have to integrate that IP database into our code now. So instead of IP location, what we're gonna instantiate is an IP database. Now the language that the IP database package speaks is a little different from the IP location. So instead of a locate method, it's gonna have a find by IP address method. And the information that we get back in that location is gonna be different too. So instead of country name, region name, and city, it's something like country, state or province, and city name. So we make those changes and we put them up for PR and the, the PR assistant says, I think it's a good opportunity to use the adapter pattern. It will allow us to talk in terms that we choose and further isolate our domain logic from outside influence. So what Clippy's talking about here is even though we didn't change the behavior of our news controller, we still had to change the code and that was because we were dependent on this package. So what would be better is if we said, listen, if you wanna work with us, you are gonna have to 
speak our language. So, and if you're gonna speak our language, you're gonna need to implement this interface that we're gonna provide to you. So our interface is called locator, and we're gonna have a method on it called from IP address. And when we call that, we expect you to return a mark. Now, if we send this to these third-party package developers, they're gonna say, well, they're gonna say nasty things, they're not gonna do it, right? So what we have to do is we have to create an adapter that is gonna adapt their packages to our interface. So what would that look like? So here's our IP location locator adapter. It's gonna implement locator, which means we're gonna have to have a from IP um, method on it that's gonna return a mark. And we can basically just take the contents of the original controller method that we wrote and put them in there, and that's gonna be our IP location locator adapter. We're gonna do the same thing with IP database locator. So it's gonna implement locator as well, and it's gonna have a from IP method, and we're gonna take the new IP database package, and we're gonna return the mark like we were doing in the controller as it is now. So now that we have these two adapters, how do we teach Laravel to, you, to pick which one that we want. So the way we would do that is in something like our app service provider, right? When we register a binding to the locator interface. So notice that we're not binding to any concrete class here, we're binding to the interface. And we're saying that when our application asks for that interface for locator, what we want you to do is just go to the configuration, pull out how we're talking to our adapter. Are we gonna be using the API or are we gonna be using the database? and serve up whichever adapter we want. So we've got that set up, and now we're ready to start integrating that into the controller method. So the way that this is gonna change is now we can actually say that when this method is called, we're relying on a locator being injected into it, and the container is gonna do that for us, right? So we don't have to instantiate a locator anymore, and the interface says that we can call a method called from IP that is gonna give us back a mark. So now our code looks like this. Right? And the best part about this is that we can change any number of providers now. All we have to do is create an adapter for it that implements our interface, and this code is only gonna have to change if we actually have to change the behavior of that controller. It doesn't have to change any other time. So we control everything about that. Now, there's still a bit of a problem. And uh, so that problem is in our tests. And the problem is that they, well, they kinda suck. Right, the problem is that uh, it looks like it might be reaching out over the network, and that slows everything down and makes our test suite even more fragile. So when we're dealing with third-party APIs that make calls to some database or reaches out over some network or something like that, what's nice is with this adapter pattern is we can create um, like a fake that we can use in our tests. And the way that we would integrate that is by binding uh, a fake locator to that interface. Right, so we can say that uh, when the app is asking for a locator, just give it this fake locator, returning some new mark that we've got. Now what would fake locator actually look like? Well, it's gonna implement the locator interface, which means we have to have a from IP method on it. And all it's gonna do is just return the mark that we instantiate the fake locator with, which means we have to have a constructor that accepts that mark. Um, and then what we've got is just a nice convenience method here called returning that accepts the mark and then creates the fake locator for us. And now our tests will run really quick and they won't reach out to any network, they won't go down to any database or anything like that, they run in isolation and things are pretty good. So what are the dependency of using the adapter pattern? Well, sorry, what are the benefits? Is, uh, well, it will invert the dependencies for us. Um, I've shown how we can swap out implementations of these adapters using our container and we've learned how to make things easier to test. All right, the strategy pattern. So the strategy pattern is actually a little difficult to understand on paper. Um, what it says is that you have a goal to accomplish a single task, but there might be multiple ways to accomplish that task based on certain criteria. So what strategies are is they're just classes that implement an agreed interface that wrap around these algorithms that complete the task based on a certain criteria. Right, still a little bit fuzzy, right? So let's talk about a scenario. So a couple of months ago, I uh, had to do my taxes. And I don't like doing taxes, uh, but something that I do like doing is writing software. So I thought a good compromise would be to write a personal finance app that did my taxes for me. And the first thing that I had to do was import the transactions from my bank. 
and it worked pretty well. So what I actually wanted to do after that was import um, past year's transactions from my bank so I could get year over year information. Uh, but the problem is, is that the files that I was gonna be importing from previous years wasn't in the format that I get from my bank. So just to give you an idea, this is what uh, the transactions from my bank look like when I, when I have them. It's a tab separated file of dates, descriptions, whether or not it was a debit to my account or a credit to my account, and then, well, there's my miserable bank balance. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the first thing that I had to do to load these into my application was create a command. And so I called it Taxitron, and it's a load command, and it accepts some path to a ledger, which is what that file is called. And our command looks like this. Uh, the handle method accepts a ledger reader. And I use that reader to parse my input file. And that reader is gonna give me back an array of transactions. And then I iterate over all of those transactions, categorizing them and then saving them down into the database. So all the meat of doing this is actually in the ledger reader class. So let's take a look at that. So the ledger reader, the entry point to the to the, to the class is this parse, parse method. Uh, so it accepts a path and what it does is it creates a file object based on it and says it's a CSV file and the delimiters are tabs. Then I take the reader and I pass it out to my read transactions method. And all that does is just instantiate an empty array and then iterates over every record of the file and skipping empty lines and then passing all the other records to my parse record method. So parse record looks like this. Basically all it does is accept the record and then figures out what the type is. So am I dealing with a debit or a credit on this transaction? Then it creates a transaction based on the date, the description, and that type that we got, okay? And like I said, it worked really well. I was able to load in all of my transactions and I got my taxes done, but uh, I was really interested in that year over year spend. Was I spending more on groceries this year? Probably I have more kids. Uh, was I spending less money on, I don't know, entertainment, those sorts of things. So, like I said though, the, the files from previous years look different. So this is what they actually look like now. So to give you an idea, the files are now separated instead of tabs, they're separated by commas. Credits and debits have switched position and I'm dealing directly with cents instead of dollars and cents. So if we were gonna change the ledger reader to support both file formats, um, and we wanted to do it in, in like a quick way, what we might be interested or thinking about doing is just saying, accepting a format, and then instead of like setting our control character here, we just might have to, have to branch based on the format. If it's raw, we're gonna say use tabs. Uh, if it's CSV, we're gonna use commas. Uh, throw an exception if it's something we haven't seen before. Uh, then read transactions is gonna have to accept that format too, right? And read transactions, accepting that format, instead of parsing out the record, what it's gonna have to do is do that branch again. If it's raw, then we're gonna parse a raw record. If it's CSV, we're gonna parse a CSV record. I'm starting to feel a little sick actually going through this. Um, because parse record now has to turn into parse raw record. And get type now has to turn into get raw type, and then in order to support CSV, we're just gonna copy this, right? And then we're gonna rename the methods. So we're gonna have parse CSV record and get CSV type. And so what we actually ended up doing is we've taken a class that looks like this, which you could argue is pretty well, pretty well written, and we turned it into something that looks like this, which is certainly not well written, and it actually makes me feel like throwing up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you might not like looking at that, so let's just say it makes me feel like a sad baby. Uh, and so there's probably a design pattern that's gonna help us deal with this sort of problem, right? Um, and so if you look at this in our read transactions, this spot right here where we do this fork based on the format, this is the real key. Because basically the execution goes down and then if based on the format we say, well we're gonna parse a raw record or we're gonna parse a CSV record, right? And so what we're actually saying here is instead of those methods, we're saying we have a strategy for parsing out raw records and a strategy for parsing out CSV records, right? Now, if you're looking at it, you're gonna say, okay, well, the format's not gonna change, right, on each iteration of the loop. So what we can probably do is just actually pull out instantiating that parser out before the loop and then use the parser inside the loop. 
And this is where we want to go. So if we wanted to create those strategies and do that, unfortunately, we can't, right? And the reason we can't is because in our parse method, we're making that same branch, right? And this branch here isn't part of the parsing strategy, okay? So we can't just make those strategies and have it work. So when, I'm in, when I run into problems like this, I think about this quote from Kent Beck. And he says, make the change easy and then make the easy change. So if we're gonna unpack that a little bit, what Kent is actually saying is, let's consider you knew about the behavior that you're gonna be adding now, that when you first wrote the code, right? How would the code look different now that you have that information, right? It would probably look something different. So why don't you refactor the code that you've got right now so that you have that information and then so adding that new change is gonna be something that's easy. Does that make sense? I don't know. Okay, well, let's, let's go through an example. So what we have to do to make the change easy is we have to stop assuming the records delimiter. Then we're gonna extract an algorithm for parsing out those records to a strategy. The next thing we have to do is prepare the ledger reader to use a different strategy based on the file format. And then finally, we're just gonna have to make sure that we fail if we encounter an unsupported format. That's gonna make the change easy for us and prepare us to make the easy change. And to make the easy change, all we have to do is create a strategy for parsing CSV records and then teach our ledger reader how to actually do that. So let's start. We're gonna stop assuming the records delimiter and that's actually pretty simple. We're just gonna delete those lines and we're done. So we're off to a good start. Moving on, we have to extract the algorithm to a strategy, okay? So because we're introducing a strategy, what we have to do is we have to create an interface for that strategy to work against. So our interface is gonna be called parser and it's gonna have a method on it called parse. Parse is gonna make sure that we return a transaction and instead of accepting an array as a record, what we have to do now is accept a string as a line and then make the strategy break that line up into a record for us. So we're just gonna change parse record to parse and make sure that it returns a transaction. And then we're gonna break up the line into the record that we want and we're gonna wrap that in a class and call that our raw parser. And that's gonna be our raw parsing strategy. All right, so now what we have to do is we have to teach the ledger reader um, how to choose a strategy based on the file format, okay? So this is where format actually is gonna come into play. So we're gonna have to add format to the parse method and then we're gonna have to pass that format down to read transactions. So then we have to change read transactions to accept a new format and here, where we're creating that raw parser, what we're gonna have to do now is we're gonna have to delegate that down to another method that's gonna make the parser for us. So we're gonna have a method called make parser that accepts format, and it's gonna look like this right now. All it's gonna do is return that new raw parser. So we've made, uh, we've made the ledger reader able to choose a strategy based on our file format, but we're not quite done here. I just wanna point something out. So do you see how format is passed into parse, but it's not used? And then it's parsed down to read transactions, but it's not used there either. And then it's passed into make parser, where it finally will get used to choosing the strategy. This tag along parameter is a smell to me. And what it says is that we should be dealing with the format sooner in our application um, and not let it like bury itself down. So I think a good spot to deal with the format would probably be in the constructor for our ledger reader so we can accept the format and then make the parser that the reader is going to use at that point. So that's gonna change our read transactions method a little bit, so we're not constructing the parser in read transactions, and when we're parsing out the records, we're just gonna use the instance variable that we have for the parser, okay? So let's move on to failing if we reach an unsupported file format. So right now, I think what we can do is just if or return. Right? If we hit a format that's not raw, throw an exception, otherwise give us back a raw parser, and we're done. All right, so we've refactored the code so that we can add that CSV strategy in a pretty easy fashion. So what we have to do is create a CSV parsing strategy. So it's gonna implement parser as well, which means it has to have that parse method on it, and we're gonna take pretty much the body of those parse CSV record and get CSV type, and we're gonna put it in here and we're gonna call that our CSV parsing strategy, okay? Now, what we have to do is teach our ledger reader how to actually make that 
that's uh, that strategy for us. So this if return isn't really gonna work anymore. What I think we need is a switch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch on the format. If it's raw, we're gonna return a raw parser, otherwise we're going to raise an exception. And now to treat, uh, to train the ledger reader how to make that CSV strategy, all we have to do is just add a new case. And then we're done. So if you look at what we started with, we had this file and it was only able to parse one file format and we've changed it into a file that looks like this, which is really able to parse any kind of format that we have a strategy for. We're never gonna have to open up Ledger Reader again. Well, I suppose we will if we have to support a new format, but let's just agree that it looks nicer, <laughs> okay? Um, but that's not the only change that we have to make, right? Because now that we're supporting an optional format, we have to change our load command. So, we can't have the container inject a ledger reader for us anymore because now the ledger reader has a constructor parameter, right? It has that format. So we're gonna have to take that out and we're just gonna have to construct the ledger reader based on the format here and those are the only changes that we have to make, all right? So what are the benefits of using the strategy pattern? Well, you can see that it simplifies the containing class by removing all of that conditional logic and turning them into strategies. It allows us to defer the decisions about what strategies we're gonna use until runtime, and then it makes the classes using the strategies just more pluggable. So if we did wanna support another format, all we had to do was create that strategy and update that switch statement, and we'd be good to go, all right? So let's talk about factories. I got a little bit more time. So factories are, they're, they're kind of interesting classes for me. I think that factories are gonna be like good scrum masters. You don't really notice a factory until they're not doing their job, right? Factories should just like stay on the outside of your application and give you the things that you need to do your job. So they are very simple classes and the only thing that they're responsible for doing is serving up instances of other classes based on some sort of criteria. So we've seen factories in these examples so far. They've just been hiding in the code. So this is the, uh, this is the example from Adapter where we were making our IP location uh, IP location adapters. And here is make parser from our, our strategies example. And you can see there's a similarity here, right? These switch statements. So these are actually factories hiding bodies of methods. So what we should do is we should extract them out so that we turn them into actually full-fetched classes. So what would that look like? So here it is from the adapter example where we create our IP location adapters. All we have to do is give that register method a better name something like make, and it's gonna accept the source and give us back a locator. And then what we can do, instead of switching on a configuration value, we're just gonna switch on the source. We're gonna take this method and we're just gonna wrap it in a class called the locator factory, and we're done. On to, oh, what happened there? Oh yeah, how do we use it? Sorry. So we're just gonna get rid of the body of that method and we're going to construct our locator factory and then use the factory's make method passing in that configuration value. And now the factory is a, is a real thing and it's, uh, and it's been extracted out. Make parser, okay, so this is gonna be a lot of the same, right? Instead of a function called make parser, what we're gonna have is a function called make that returns a parser. And then we're gonna wrap that in a class called parser factory. And you've noticed that I've left a little bit of space up there and that's just because I don't like those string literals. I'd rather those be constants. And that creates our parser factory. So in our ledger reader, when we wanna use it, all we have to do is get rid of that switch and create a new parser factory and return the factory based on the format. So this is what Ledger Reader actually looks like and I wanna point something out here. And again, it's with this format. I keep on picking on it. So you see how format comes into the constructor and then gets passed down to make parser and then make parser accepts it and then passes that into the factory all so that we can just get a parsing strategy out. It just makes me wanna think, you know, why can't the parser just be given directly to the reader, right? Kind of makes sense to me. Um, so why don't we do that, right? Instead of accepting a format, what we're gonna do is accept that parser. And then so we don't need to call make parser anymore because we have the parser, so we can just assign it directly to the instance variable. Because we're not calling make parser, well we just don't need make parser there, now that's gone. So we're not using that factory in our class anymore uh, it's just being injected, like the parser that it generates is just being given to us so that we can use it. And so it's doing the job that a factory should do. It's just on the outside giving us the things that we need to do our jobs. 
So how's that gonna change our load command? Well, now the ledger reader, it can't pass in the format, right? It has to pass in a parser. So unfortunately, this option here has to turn into make parser this option format. And then so make parser uh, comes back, right? That's a bit of a problem for me. Because look at this line. Reader equals new ledger reader, this make parser, this option format. That's pretty ugly to read, right? I don't wanna read that every time I open up this class. Something that I'd probably like to read instead is something like make reader, right? So let's do that. Let's make parser make reader. And so it's gonna accept the format and instead of passing back our parsing strategy, all it's gonna do is return a new ledger reader using a parsing strategy that was given to it by the parsing factory. Now if you look at that make reader, that kind of looks like a factory too, right? So it looks like a ledger reader factory. And the ledger reader factory, it's kind of neat, it actually depends on the parser factory. And the parser factory, we can use that in the make method to give us back a ledger reader, just by saying, give us a new ledger reader and parsing factory, give us a parsing strategy based on this format. Now you might be thinking to yourself right now, hold on, right, you've gone too far. Why would I do something like this? This doesn't make any sense. It just seems like it's more complicated, right? Well, consider this. If the factory lives on the outside and the service container knows how to construct it, we actually don't have to make a reader in this spot here. We can just say that the handle method depends on a ledger reader factory, right? And so the container knows how to construct that for us. It knows how to construct a parsing factory. It knows how to construct the ledger reader factory. So because we're having it injected into our class, we can just say factory, make me a reader based on this format. And now we don't need that make reader again. And our load method, our load command looks like this, right? And it looks almost exactly like what it did at the original start of this example. And I think that's pretty good. So what are the benefits of using factories? Um, well, they move the creation logic out of those dependent classes and they move them into the periphery, again, where they belong, in my opinion. They're simple and they're composable and we can use it to lean on the service container to construct those factories when we want them and inject them where we need them. And that's probably my time, so thank you.